we hear all the big stuff about coffee. We hear that maybe it's good for fat loss. We hear that it's good for cognitive performance, good for physical performance. But I've got eight caffeine studies, coffee studies, that you've never heard of before that put a completely different twist on things. I'm gonna jump right into this first one that was published in the International Society of Sports Nutrition. This was one of the most fascinating, specifically fat loss caffeine studies. This study had subjects consume three milligrams of caffeine per kilogram of body weight. Okay, and they had them consume this at either 8 a.m. or 5 p.m. Okay, and then they did VO2 max testing and what is called a maximal fatty acid oxidation test. So how much fat they were actually oxidizing and burning. What is really wild here is that when subjects consumed caffeine at 8 a.m., they ended up increasing their maximum fatty acid oxidation by about 10.7%. That's a pretty significant amount of fat burned. Okay, but that's no surprise because a lot of us know that caffeine helps liberate fats and increases fatty acid oxidation. Here's what's really interesting. The 5 p.m. group had a 29% plus increase in fat oxidation. We're talking literally almost 3x the amount of fat oxidized by having caffeine at 5 p.m. Well, I know you're thinking this, like, okay, I'm not gonna have caffeine at 5 p.m. That's gonna affect my sleep. But when you look at this kind of literature, it really makes you scratch your head and kind of like wonder why. And here's a quote from the actual researchers in the study. A combination of acute caffeine intake and exercise at moderate intensity in the afternoon provides the best scenario for individuals seeking to increase maximum fat oxidation. So we could sit here and we could speculate why. And I have some theories. It might have to do with uh, sort of the natural states of cortisol in the morning. Like maybe you're not increasing as much fatty acid oxidation in the morning because your cortisol levels are already higher. So your fat oxidation rates naturally, diurnally would be higher in the morning as is. And maybe in the morning since, or in the evening since cortisol is lower, you're having a bigger spike. It's a bigger delta change of like when, what you're getting out of the caffeine, right? So it's like, it's not necessarily comparing the morning to the evening. It's comparing the, the evening to the evening. So in this case, like because you're already oxidizing less fat, because you have more adenosine built up, yeah, maybe you're just flat out gonna get more out of the caffeine at that point in time. But let's talk about the elephant that's in the room right now, the sleep piece. So I'm gonna talk about the second study. Now this study was published in the Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine and they gave subjects 400 milligrams of caffeine, that's a lot of caffeine, at zero, three, and six hours prior to sleep. And what they found is that all of these led to impaired sleep. Most of them had a hard time falling asleep, but there was also a pretty significant change in their total sleep time. So they ended up waking up earlier and they ended up having more wake events. What's interesting is that they were all about the same. Even the group that had the caffeine right before bed. Now you've probably heard of this thing called a caffeine nap. If you can actually consume caffeine and fall asleep fast enough, there's evidence that a caffeine nap can actually make you, well, essentially make you be able to get by with less sleep, but you can't do that repeatedly. Like it's a hack that you can do every now and then. So this is kind of frustrating because here we read before that I can have caffeine in the evening or late afternoon and get more out of my total like fat loss. So some of the things that I was thinking was, well, in this one particular study that they talked about with the fat loss, they didn't really look at testing midday. Maybe having some caffeine at noon could have uh, double the effect in the morning versus triple that we'd have in the evening. So maybe we could have caffeine at noon and then work out and that could get us at least double the fat loss benefit of the morning, right? And I'm not saying don't have caffeine in the morning. I'm just, this is interesting stuff. And that way we could get a little less of the sleep effect. Another kind of hack that you can do is if you've ever heard of apigenin or apigenin, depending on potato, potato, that is a compound that can block some of the influx of calcium ions into a cell. That is part of what caffeine does, okay? It does a number of different things. So it can drive high amounts of calcium into a cell, creating sort of an excitatory response. One of the many sort of cascading effects of caffeine. So if you have apigenin, you theoretically do not block the necessary, necessarily the fat burning effect, but you do block some of the energy effect. So you're not gonna get as much of a stimulatory physical performance effect, but you might still get the fat liberation. So in theory, you could take caffeine with apigenin, and you could have it later in the day and possibly be able to sleep better because the apigenin can block some of the sleep 
inhibiting effects. Let's move on. If we're still talking about the brain, there's actually some evidence that caffeine has huge neuroprotective effects. This was published in the journal Clinical and Experimental Pathology. It was a rodent model study, but it was still very interesting. They took rodents and they treated them with aluminum. Basically, they triggered neurodegenerative diseases. So they gave them high amounts of aluminum chloride so it would induce sort of an Alzheimer's effect. They found that caffeine actually blocked that in a way where it protected the structural effect of the brain, the structural compounds of the brain. So it had this protective structural effect where the brain didn't morph and change the way it does in neurodegenerative diseases. There was also an increased expression of BDNF. And this wasn't to any small degree. This was like an actual changing in some of the, the gene expression here so the brain could kind of reproduce and recover and repair. Additionally, some of the antioxidants in caffeine, like the chlorogenic acid, seemed to reduce the systemic inflammation so much that it had a neuroprotective effect. So this sounds kind of off the rails, not the typical caffeine stuff, but that's what I'm going for. What's interesting here is that we see that caffeine isn't damaging our brain it could be protecting our brain. This next study is interesting because we're talking about withdrawals. And there are some myths surrounding withdrawals. People say the longer that you've consumed caffeine, the more withdrawals you are going to have. And I could see how that could be theoretically correct. But when you look at the data, it's not quite that way. As a matter of fact, the NIH reports that about 50% of people that come off of caffeine have withdrawals like headaches. Okay, only about 13% of people actually have impairment or fatigue to such a degree where it changes their performance or their like physical function of the day. Now, athletes might be at a different level because caffeine is clearly a performance enhancer. And if you come off of it, you probably will see a decline in performance to a measurable degree, but not necessarily for a recreational athlete. Point is, is that the impairment, the physical change when we come off of caffeine isn't nearly what we think. And although caffeine technically can have withdrawal symptoms, it's not truly addictive. I did another video on this. It doesn't affect the dopaminergic system the same way that other like recreational drugs would. Now, it's still addictive because you can get addicted to the physical feeling of it, but it's not as physically addictive as like some of these other things. That being said, you can form this addiction or have withdrawal symptoms as early as three days of caffeine consumption. So like you take caffeine, never taken caffeine before, you have it for three days, you build a tolerance to it and you might have withdrawal symptoms. The interesting thing, but kind of a good thing is, is that this continues to increase to about 13 days, but after that, it's about the same. So whether someone's been consuming caffeine for 13 straight days or three months, they probably have similar addictions to it and they probably are going to have the same sort of withdrawals. Now, the other good news that we don't hear a whole lot is that it really only takes three to five days to reset this withdrawal. Okay, so all you have to do is stop caffeine for three to five days and you're probably right back to the beginning again. So it's almost like, okay, maybe every 20 days or so, take a couple days off, take a weekend off, do something, be worthless for a couple days without your coffee. The other thing that I would mention is that decaf coffee still has a lot of the benefits, right? We're gonna talk more, but there's another study about that. You could always have decaf, still get a little bit of caffeine with it, still get the antioxidant effect and still get some of this stuff that might make you feel really good, right? You can still get, you could almost placebo yourself into that, right? I also put a link down below for Thrive Market because they have a bunch of different kinds of coffees. By the way, independent of coffee, I think you should check out Thrive Market. They've been a sponsor on this channel for a long time and that is a 30% off discount link for all of your groceries through Thrive Market. It's one of the largest online grocery stores, except they specialize in only quote unquote better for you options, right? So they don't have dyes, they're not gonna have red dye 40. It's gonna be stuff you can trust. Even the tasty like processed food, right? And I say processed food loosely because yes, they do have options like that, but it's not the typical hyper palatable stuff, right? They have good options. They also have sustainable meat and seafood. They've got all kinds of frozen options too. And that's a 30% off discount link. So if you wanna do your grocery shopping and save some cash and you wanna try them out and get it delivered to your doorstep, really think it's worth it. It's a pretty big game changer in the world of like grocery shopping in general. So that is a 30% off discount link plus 
there is a $60 free gift and that is exclusive to people that watch my channel. So that 30% off your grocery order, you're not gonna go find that on their website. You're not gonna find it on the internet with a coupon code or something that's exclusive because I've worked with them for a very long time. So people that watch my channel get that discount. So that link is down below. You can sort by diet type. You can sort by different types of coffee. You can sort by different forms, different roads. I mean, the coffee selection is unreal because the founders of Thrive are big coffee people too. So check them out. Different forms, also instant forms, all kinds of cool stuff. Link in the top line of the description down below. The next piece is really, 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 really interesting. Don't get scared away when I say microbiome, okay? Because this is beyond just what you would think. Okay, so obviously microbiome is important. Obviously, we don't know diddly squat about the grand scheme of it. We only know the big pieces. But there was a study published in the journal Nutrients that looked at fecal microbiota. So it was looking at basically what was coming out in the poop. Okay. And they broke down like coffee consumption. So people that consume no coffee, moderate amounts of coffee, high amounts of coffee, yada, yada. What they found is that the more the coffee consumption, the better the microbiome, but more specifically, very significant differences in what is called bacteroidetes. Bacteroidetes is the bacteria, the one bacteria that we pretty much know is associated with better metabolic health, better health outcomes, healthier just metabolic people, right? People that are active, people that eat well. Bacteroidetes is correlated strongly with that. On the opposite end, there's something called Firmicutes. Now, Firmicutes is associated with ob obesity and other things, right? So it's not as good. Here's what's wild is, sure, there could be like polyphenols, things in coffee that are supporting the microbiome. I am inclined to think it's not necessarily that. I throw, sure that plays a part, but I think that people that are consuming caffeine are likely a little more active, even if they're people that are sedentary. Like it's making them more active than these people that don't consume it. So I think there's a metabolic component that's at play. I also think coffee is an appetite suppressant, which increases gut motility because you're giving your gut a break. So perhaps you're getting a little bit more time for digestion to occur and that's good for the microbiome. We don't have all the answers, but it seems as though coffee generally is good for the metabolism. Then we look at the mental health piece. This is a big study published in Nutrients, 14,400 some odd people, okay? And it found straight up that people that consumed more coffee ended up having better mental health. Four cups plus per day was associated with lower risks, the lowest risks of depression. Now this happens for a couple of reasons. For one, there is a clear dopaminergic effect of caffeine. I mean, you have coffee, it's gonna increase this dopamine feel. You're gonna feel better. But coffee is pretty readily accessible and I don't think we're running out of it anytime soon in terms of caffeine. So like, if that's gonna help you get through your day, I think it's a net positive, especially when you look at the other effects. Now I'm sure that caffeine is still a problem to a certain degree if you're completely dependent on it. But if it does help you get through rough times, I mean, coffee's gotten me through some pretty rough times before, so there's merit there. The second piece is we do have chlorogenic acid, we do have these compounds in coffee that definitely could reduce systemic inflammation. Very clear links there. Systemic inflammation is strongly correlated with depression and vice versa. So maybe there's something there. Maybe it's a double whammy. A fun and interesting one study that people probably haven't heard, 2022 study published in the clinical uh, journal Gastroenterology, excuse me. Interesting because they found with this that coffee consumption, the more caffeine consumption, the less liver stiffness there was. Now, liver stiffness is associated with less ability for the liver to do its job. Look at like statosis, for example, or fatty liver. Like you get into this like scarring stage. Once the liver is scarred, it can't do its job anymore. It gets stiffer and stiffer and stiffer, right? So when you're reducing liver stiffness, you're essentially improving the ability for your liver to do its job. So this particular study found that three or more cups of coffee reduced liver stiffness. Do you think it's because it's increasing just metabolic flow, like things are operating faster, the liver's being used? I'm inclined to think that it's more about fatty acid oxidation because fat does tend to build in our liver. Oxidative stress tends to build in our liver. And if we're actually able to oxidize that fat at the liver level first, then that would make sense. Like reducing fat mass overall is good for longevity, good for organ health, but specifically surrounding the liver region, right? Because once the liver starts to gain fat around it, it starts to lose some of its function. And that's like the first line of defense when it comes down to our glucose levels, all these things. So we don't know the full answer there, but this data is still quite interesting. And I saved one of the best ones for last. This study 
I love it because so many people will tell you that caffeine is bad for your heart. It's bad for longevity. Not really. In fact, when you look at cardiovascular disease, it's quite the opposite. So this study was published in the European Journal of Preventative Cardiology. It took a look at over 449,000 people, almost a half a million people. And they looked at ground coffee, decaf coffee, and instant coffee in varying amounts. Zero cups per day, one to three, three to five, five plus, okay, yada, yada, various amounts, all kinds of different data sets. What they found is that ground coffee ended up having the best impact when it came to a reduction of cardiovascular disease, a 20% reduction in cardiovascular disease with ground coffee, a 6% reduction with decaf coffee and a 9% reduction with instant. What I find most interesting about this is that it doesn't seem to be the caffeine content because they were all similar caffeine in the, uh, in the two groups of the instant and the ground. But what's interesting is that the decaf still had an impact. So it tells us that A, there's something with the antioxidants and the polyphenols that are in coffee. Okay, definitely something there. But also tells us that instant coffee ends up denaturing a lot of those antioxidants just by the sheer nature of the heating and the processing. So we lose some of the effect there. So we definitely find out that, okay, the antioxidants play a role. There's something there. But then the ground coffee with a 20% reduction in cardiovascular disease risk, there's something happening there, right? So the caffeine has this impact. Now the lowest risk of cardiovascular disease came at about four to five cups of ground coffee per day. That's crazy. Like that's a lot of coffee for most people. And I don't recommend everyone goes out and does that. But there's definitely something there, right? It's not taxing your heart. As a matter of fact, there are even reductions in atrial fibrillation. So actually improvements in some of the heart function itself. Now the other thing is, it probably seems it's more so the reduction in oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is a hallmark of aging. Increased ROS, this is not good stuff, right? So if coffee is like the most antioxidant rich beverage that we consume, probably the most concentrated amount of antioxidants most Americans at least are getting in their day, I think it's a net win. But there's also another study, and it's been a while since I referenced it, so I can't remember where it's published, but essentially those that drink coffee had better metabolic health, but they also had less frailty. Okay, so that could simply be the fact that those that drink coffee are going to be more active as they're older. So it's like a net balance we have to look at. If someone's gonna consume coffee, even if it could be potentially bad, but it allows them to get moving, that's what we want, right? Versus someone that's say like not consuming coffee for their health, but then they're so tired, they don't get up and do the things that they should do to get moving. I for one am not opposed to caffeine. I do like to take periods of time away from it from now and then, but all in all, I think it's a net win if we use it responsibly. I'll see you tomorrow.